So we're going to get started here. Bob Pollan's going to be talking to us about uh, adding modularity afterwards with embedding OSGI. All right. Uh, well, welcome. So as Bill said, the uh, nature of this talk is about adding modularity afterwards um, by embedding OSGI. So I'll just start off just a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm an independent consultant, and I like to say I have three jobs. Um, my first job is there's, there's a couple different things on there, but most of it's about helping clients deliver software more frequently with quality to production. And uh, modularity and OSGI are, are some of the things that help me do that. Um, so that's why we're going to be talking about that. Uh, my second job is I'm also the community leader of the Chicago Java Users Group. Um, we do a couple different things. We've got an 800 member community in Chicago. We do presentations twice a month. Um, we have a mentorship program where people can sign up for mentors, ask questions to our mailing list and get answers if they need help on a particular problem. Um, we are also always looking for presenters. So if you're interested in presenting and you happen to be in Chicago, we, let's uh, reach out to me and, and we can work that out. So um, we can talk about that afterwards. And then finally, last but not least, uh, proud father and husband. I've got three kids and a cat to keep me busy when these other things are not keeping me busy. Um, and you know, I have a cat. Developers seem to like cats. I have no idea why. All right, so the nature of this talk is we've built a product, and now what? So any architectural talk should start off with the story of regret, because Engineering, in my opinion, is generally learned through pain. Um, so I'm going to just start off with a tale of regret that I had um, building an application for a master's level project a long time ago. Um, I was coaching football at the time, and I was trying to figure out why players had difficulty finding their positions on the field. So this is American football. Um, so I wanted to build a, a GUI application that would run through some cognitive modeling um, using SOAR, which is a University of Michigan project, um, to kind of model how the mind works, and see if I could find if there were certain plays and, or certain positions that were more complex than others. So as I started this application, I was, oh no. As I started this application, the um, getting the pieces to come together started very quickly, and I had success initially and um, got the thing to work. But then I started adding features. So okay, in, in football you can have it where a player will go in motion at a certain point in a play. And as I was adding features, I found I was breaking things in other parts of the application. I found that changing one thing, even if it was a very small change, had a lot of impact throughout the code base. And eventually I got to the point where I was afraid to move. Anything that I changed broke something somewhere else. Um, from what I've seen, you know, your application life cycle, people talk about application life cycle, but this is kind of what it looks like for most applications. You start off with a great idea, you get some momentum on that idea, you get it to work and you're all excited. And then somebody comes up with a new feature. And it's not something you've thought of before. You didn't consider it. You didn't build your application to adapt to that. And now you've got to make changes but you're at the top of this pyramid. I can do anything I want. So I make those changes and then I get burned. And as I get burned more, I get more and more scared. I, I get more and more pain and suddenly, you know what, don't, I'm telling my junior developer, don't touch anything. You have to talk to me before we do anything with this application. And that's not a good place to be as an organization or as a developer. So is there hope after you reach that point where I don't want to touch anything? And that's kind of what this talk is about. This talk is about um, we've reached this point with an application. We don't feel like we can move. What are the next steps? So this talk also is, is, is really about, you know, we're kind of stuck with the code base. You know, as a consultant, when you go into a gig, and if you say, yeah, we got to rewrite the whole thing from scratch, that's not always a very popular thing to say to a client. So sometimes you just have to roll with the punches. But if you could start over, if you could put an ax to the thing and say, well, what do we want to start with? That's really the place to start with where you want to go next. So if I had an application and I know this application is going to change, some of the things I might want is I might want 
the ability to have kind of a plug-in architecture so that as I, as I change things, I can add things without impacting everything else. I would want an architecture that's decoupled um, physically and kind of logically um, so I can have separate deployable artifacts. I want the ability to roll back. If I break something, I want to be able to fix it very quickly in production. That's probably the biggest saving grace of being able to build things quickly and, and iterate. If you can roll it back, people are a lot more forgiving. If it's, well, we got a week because we have to build and we have to do all these things, people will not forgive you for breaking their product. Um, and just to be able to evolve it quickly. Um, so requirements change and, and development teams change and, and as those things change, you want to be able to evolve one part of the application without impacting the other parts of the application. Um, so those are some of the things I would want if I was able to start over from scratch. A lot of those things are kind of themes in modularity. Um, so by adding modularity to my architecture or designing in a modular way, I can get some of those benefits. Um, but remember, I've already got an application. Um, and this is usually the part in a presentation on OSGI where you show all the puzzle pieces fitting together. And I actually don't like that analogy very much because with a puzzle piece, the pieces have to fit exactly. I like this diagram or this picture of my son at the top of, of, of this playground with all these interwoven ropes. So I think this analogy works because if I were to cut one of the ropes, the whole thing doesn't necessarily come crashing down. This, this design is robust. Not everything is connected to everything else, but the things that are connected, if they fail, there's other ways for him to get down. That's kind of my view on modularity. It's really, it's really a web of things connected together such that if I were to replace one piece of it, it the, the entire structure is not um, kind of tainted in that way. So as I make changes, I may break something, but I don't break everything. So what are my options when it comes to modular software design or, or software stacks? So the, these options that I'm going to talk about are all in the Java space. Um, Java is my language of choice or JVM languages. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of things that, that you could use. So the very first thing to cover is, is by far the most mature is it's OSGI. Um, it's been around for 10 plus years. There's a specification built around it. Um, the beauty of having a mature product is, is people have had time to put together tools. So you have BND tools, you have your Eclipse support, you have Maven support, you have Gradle support. Um, you know, anything you can think of, whatever your tool is, chances are, or whatever, uh, whatever IDE you're using, chances are you're going to be able to work with, with this product. Um, it's the only thing out there that actually enforces modularity. So one of the things about OSGI is it's actually a little bit harder to do the wrong thing than it is to do the right thing. So within OSGI, you have to establish contracts between the different bundles that are talking to each other. And if you want bundles to kind of break that contract, you have to deal with, um, if, you wanna, if you wanna create bundles that break that contract, you have to deal with um, some kind of special little toggles that they put in to do that. So I mean, for example, if, if I were using reflection and I wanted to pull a class from another bundle that is not referenced in, in my bundle, there's a way to do that, but you kind of have to use some trickery. It's much easier just to design it such that you're explicitly pulling in the, um, the packages that, that you want for that bundle. Um, you get versioning for free. So all of the bundles in OSGI, you have the, the semantic versioning there, so the three-digit numbers. Um, and that versioning is enforced by the framework. So when you, you, you use different releases, you can specifically say, this bundle, this piece of code is dependent on this version or this range of versions of this other piece of code, this other module. Um, there's some other frameworks that are, are being built out there to do some of the versioning pieces, but um, I think OSGI does it the best. Um, now, with, all, with some of this power, you do inherit some complexity as well. Um, so one of the things, one of the really cool things you get with OSGI is I don't necessarily have to shut down the framework to get changes. I can deploy code to the framework, let it run, and that code will be loaded into class loaders dynamically at runtime. Um, 
that's usually one of the first things people will say about OSGI. Not everybody uses that feature, um, but to enable that, you have multiple class loaders. So each bundle, each jar in the framework has its own class loader. Um, so when you think about inner bundle sharing, you're moving classes between class loaders or you're switching contexts to make things work. Um, so this gives a lot of people headaches sometimes. And it's one of the things that um, drives people to say, oh, I hate OSGI, it's way too complex. It's really not the framework, it's, it's kind of how you're using it most time. Um, and then I guess I already got to just, just the runtime ability. The fact that the platform is up, it's running, I can deploy code to it right now, um, and I don't have to do a rolling bounce or whatever so my clients can, can see that change. So one of the other, um, the other ways you can go is just using inversion of control. So this is a spring or a, or a juice type framework. Um, you know, with those frameworks, they're very lightweight. They encourage you to build to an interface, which is kind of one of the first steps to building, uh, you know, modular code, uh, but not in a physical way, just in a logical way. Um, they're very easy to add to existing systems. I can just drop in a jar or, or, or the spring jar and just start configuring things with spring. Pivotal and, and other companies um, have built a lot of tools around this type of approach because it's so popular. Um, one problem with this approach is the modularity is not actually enforced. There's nothing within Spring or within Juice that's going to force you to do things modularly. It's encouraged you to use an interface, but you know what? If you want to use the implementation, yeah, you can just drive the implementation to people. You know? So if you're a junior developer or you're a lazy developer, it's not harder to do the wrong thing. It's easy to do the wrong thing in the inversion of control. Um, the other thing I mentioned that's not on there is, is there's, no, there's no real physical separation. So in this, I can still just build my application into one big jar and deploy that. There, within OSGI, you're a little bit more um, kind of guided to split things out so that you have um, physical separation as well as logical separation. Um, no versioning. So you don't have the opportunity to say, all right, this, this code is going to use version XYZ um, versus ABC. Um, and finally, uh, there's a project that has been delayed frequently um, from Oracle called Jigsaw. Um, it started in Java 7, and this is modularity within the JDK. Um, the idea behind that is that you would have these versioned uh, modules, dot mod files, that would break apart um, the JDK, or the, the Java runtime, actually, the JRE, um, so that you could pare it down and just pick the things within the JRE that you want. Um, it keeps getting pushed back. Java 7 just wasn't ready. Java 8, hey, we're really excited about lambdas. Java 9, it was promised once again. We'll see when it gets there. Um, when it gets there, I still don't expect it to be very mature. Some of the hacking that I've done on it, um, you know, if you're working with very simple bundles, it works just fine. Um, but still, I haven't seen a lot of the promises that they've made in the requirements, such as the runtime. Um, environment working, um, and the, uh, the interplay with OSGI. There is a separate project, Penrose, that's supposed to support OSGI within Jigsaw, um, but there haven't been commits on that for about the last 10 months, so we'll see when that starts up again. With Jigsaw, you do get versioning, um, so they do allow you to version the modules, and you're allowed to import um, a specific version um, of code, but um, again, you don't really, uh, the versioning is not necessarily um, as robust as what you get with OSGI. All right, so let's say we've, we've gone through all the pros and cons and we've decided, all right, it's time to go with OSGI. Um, most of the, if you, if you read a lot of blogs and you talk to a lot of people, the way that people will tell you to, to move to an OSGI platform is you take your project and you put it all in one big bundle and then you start breaking it apart into smaller bundles as you go. Um, this approach works quite well with many code bases, but I'm here to talk about the embedded scenario and some of the advantages of that. So when would it make sense to do it a little bit differently? Um, so let's talk about some of the things that may come up in a project that where you're trying to take that one big bundle approach, but will make it fall apart. So the first thing 
is maybe I just want an isolated container for clients to build bundles to use on top of my application. I don't want to go through the work of building everything into a single, into a, into a OSGI environment, but I want a piece of my application to support this specification. What if my client is working with some very unfriendly libraries for OSGI? So some of the talks earlier in the, in the conference talked about um, you know, where Hibernate used to be. Now it is compliant. But environments that do some funky things with class loading that don't jive very well in an OSGI bundle. If you're able to run those things outside of OSGI but run the rest of your framework within OSGI, you can solve some of those problems. Licensing and proprietary code. So I'm not a lawyer, but there are people that have told me not to bundle certain things together um, because they don't really fit. Because of the licensing of the proprietary code, it can't be included with, with the project. Um, but again, if you're not able, when you put a big bundle together, it does become one big deployable artifact that you can't really easily tease apart unless you're going to uh, unzip the whole thing. And finally, this is probably the biggest that I hear, no time, no budget, no desire. I mean, so OSGI can become a very political discussion within an organization. Um, there's people that have very strong opinions on both sides of it, and a lot of times that causes just kind of stalemate. And the default is not to go with OSGI most of the time, because it's not the thing that people are as familiar with, and that, um, that they, it's, it's kind of uncharted waters for a lot of people. Um, so the embedding case is, is a way to allow you to experiment with OSGI to test the waters with a part of the application and build that momentum to, to make that conversation happen with the organization to say, this is how we should be doing all of our software. Um, so the embedded case is a good just kind of foot in the door to get that started. So let's talk about a little bit of design of, of how this all works together. Um, so Within your existing application, there's a couple things that you would need to add in order for embedding to work. Um, so one of those things is the actual OSGI framework. Um, so once you get the framework in there and initialize it, um, you have a running container within your application. Um, you'll need to build out service interfaces. And generally, I've placed those service interfaces in the existing application, because those can be exposed to the framework from the existing, uh, the existing app. You'll need some code within uh, the existing application to access the services that are provided by the framework. Um, most of these are very generic things, and, and um, they're very simple. Um, but OSGI has hooks where you can access classes with filters and um, with interface classes, um, very similar to how any other dependency, uh, like a dependency injection framework does. You also want a directory to put your bundles in. Uh, you may want more than one directory to put your bundles in if you need different start levels. So OSGI allows you to specify the order that you start things in case you need certain things to start before other things. Um, so you can specify those things in separate folders if necessary. Um, all of those things interact with the framework. And by the way, all of this is happening in a single JVM. These aren't separate applications or processes. Um, and within there, you've got your OSGI runtime and your bundles that are binding to that runtime. The other thing that you have to do within the existing application is you have to determine what your contract with the runtime is going to be. Um, so there's a couple different ways to expose things to the framework when you're embedding. Um, boot delegation is one way to expose classes that are in a bundle at, at start time to um, the framework bundle. But I actually prefer using um, extending the system library. Um, one thing that you get with extending the system library is you're, you're creating that same type of contract that you would have between bundles in the OSGI environment. So you have to pick those packages that are going to be exported from your existing application to the framework. The thing that that allows me to do is I can exclude certain things that I don't want people touching. So if I have that really bad library that's not going to work very well in the framework, I can say, you know what, I don't want that package to be exported into the framework for use. Um, 
Also, if I'm doing that third-party container use case, if I, there's things I don't want my clients touching or my third parties touching, I can say that package is also not available. Um, so you can see in the example, um, bundles that are using exported classes will spin up and they'll become active within there. But if, if somebody tries to cheat the system and they start using packages that are not available, um, those bundles will just stay at installed and they'll never actually spin up. So to get started, all you really need is the Felix Framework Bundle. Um, this, this bundle is a, it's, it's under a mag, it's like, I, it's a couple kilobytes. Um, and you can get started and spin up the framework. Um, but I would recommend probably a couple more. Um, kind of the power of, of you is using the OSGI framework is really the community that's built around it and the things that you can kind of get for free. Um, so with that, I would also recommend going with a config admin so that you can use configuration within your bundles. Um, I would recommend using um, the SCR, the service component runtime, um, or you can use Blueprint. It just depends you know, which types of things you want to use for your services. You can get a web council for free. So if you don't feel like building an administrative uh, GUI for your application, you can get one for free. Um, and if you're doing shell, you can get a shell for free in your application. You just integrate the GoGo -Go shell and you can implement commands. Uh, we had some presentations on that yesterday, as well as you know, if you want to do continuous delivery and deployment, you can use the ACE management agent. You can put that in your framework and be able to deploy things to it quickly. Um, so what are some good places to start? So if I, if I want to start putting things into my application, I generally want to pick something that's a lower bar just so I can have success with it than try to change the world with it right off the bat. Um, some places, some easy things to start with is just putting your configuration. So if you have app configuration that's stored in other places or hard coded in the application, you can move that into the OSGI framework and, and use the management console. And I'll show, is show that part in the demo. You can use factories, so building things um, within the framework where maybe I want to create factories um, after the fact or I want to inject things to build new things without tearing, thing, tearing the framework down. Um, those are also good things to, to start with when you're using the embedded framework. If you have resources, so I have um, you know, images that I want to deploy as a, as a bundle to my application and you don't worry about having those on your class path, you can put those into OSGI bundles and consume them from the framework as well. Um, so my uh, demo code does all three of these. These are the three things that I cover in that. Um, so some of the caveats. Most applications are already multi-threaded, but if your application is simple and it's not multi-threaded, this is something you may want to understand. The, the framework does use threads, so the thread that your service is running in may not be the same thread that your main application is running in. So just something to keep in mind that memory model publishing and, and things of that nature are suddenly become important in that case. Um, you only want to use one framework instance. So I've talked a lot about adding this. If you're already using a web container, such as uh, Wildfly or you're using Glassfish, um, those already come with embedded OSGI containers within them. So this approach is already being used in, in major products as well. Um, but if you have it already, just use the one that they have. Having multiple frameworks doesn't really give you a whole lot of advantage. I haven't really seen a use case where you would want more than one framework. Um, but if you do combine them, there is warnings in the documentation that says, yeah, you're kind of heading into areas where we really haven't experimented too much. Um, there are some IDE tricks that involved in making this work. Um, one of the things that I ran into um, putting the example code together is if you're using Maven or you're using a um, dependency management within your, um, within your, uh, your IDE to build, you need a way to take your existing application and provide that the, the classes that need to be exported to your bundles um, if, as a dependency. Um, so one of the things I had to do is I took the existing application and I built a, um, a Maven jar out of it that I could include as a dependency. Now, I don't ever load that jar into the OSGI environment, but I use it for my build process. And I'll, um, and the classes that are available in there then become uh, available within the IDE, so when I'm writing code, I get you know, my autocomplete and everything else. 
The other thing I noticed as I was building out the demo code is my package tangling got worse before it got better. Um, so one of the things you want to keep an eye on is as you're doing this, you want to make sure that your coupling is not getting worse. So using a, um, an open source product such as Sonar that is going to tell you when you're creating dependencies or, or perhaps uh, cyclical dependencies between uh, physical or just logical pieces of your application, packages, for example, um, you want to keep an eye on that to make sure that it doesn't get worse. Because adding the hooks in to where the OSGI container is, is being used can sometimes create some cross dependencies that you may not want. Okay, so talk is cheap. Let's take a look at some of the demo code. Um, so what's my embedded use case? So my embedded use case is actually using some of the same stack that I was using to do my, my master's project that I was working on. Um, so it uses SOAR, which is a uh, cognitive modeling architecture developed at the University of Michigan. Um, and they co it comes with a grid game where you can put tanks on there and they use um, sonar and they'll use different things to find other tanks and shoot them and blow them up and score points. Um, the game's kind of fun just to kind of watch and then you can try different types of um, strategies within the language, the, the SOAR language, to make the tanks either smarter or dumber based on that. Um, the SOAR architecture is written in C++ with Java bindings, um, so the, the game itself is, a, is very coupled together with the C++ and the architecture is, is it's a little rough, and we'll take a look at Sonar just to show where those rough spots are. Um, written in SWT, you can use SWT in, in there, that's what Eclipse does, so that there's no, no necessarily bad thing about SWT forcing the embedded case, um, but the big case is multiple games. If I wanna change a game, the architecture really doesn't let me do that without touching a bunch of places throughout the code. Um, so my use case is I wanna take those tanks and turn them into things that every developer likes. I'm gonna turn them into cats and the cats are gonna run around shooting each other. So what does this design look like? Um, so we've got our SOAR application, which is our existing code base. We've added our Felix framework bundle to the library and we've got several startup bundles. So the startup bundles are the ones that load um, into the application before everything else spins up, so these are kind of our, our number one uh, start levels. Um, within there, I've got a configuration bundle that starts up with the application. Um, I have the management agent, I'm still working on that piece. Um, the SCR services, the shell, HTTP, and the web console. Um, all the bundles are within the, the source code and you can look and see which bundles I'm using. Um, so if you're trying to build yourself your own Felix um, framework from scratch, you can, you can do that. Um, so exposing packages to the framework via the system packages. So when you start the framework, it takes a map with a bunch of configuration options. Um, so you're gonna wanna specify what your contract is with your, with your uh, runtime. So here I have, you know, I'm exporting some of the, um, the existing application classes so that I can use them within the framework. Um, that's all this is really doing and I get the opportunity to version those things. So if there's certain things I wanna allow in, in different versions of my application, I can do that. Starting the framework, there's really not much to see here. Um, after I've started it, I can start loading bundles in. Um, the way I've done that is programmatically, it's just taking the bundles from the, um, from the file system and starting them up. The code to do that is, is also relatively simple. It it's varies based on how you wanna handle errors if, if any of your startup bundles um, don't start. But the existing application will start up just fine even if the framework itself doesn't or if some of the bundles in the framework do not start up, it's not always a deal killer anyway, so you may, you know, you may just fail silently or just log something. So supplying services from the framework to the non-OSGI code, so the existing application. Um, so getting service references uh, can be as easy as passing in the interface, as long as there's only one implementation of that interface. Um, so within here, if, if I'm doing something that constructs the the 2D grid world, I can pass in an interface that says, okay, give me something that implements this interface. It'll look in the framework, it'll find a reference to it, and it will expose it back, and then I can start making manip manipulations on that service class within the framework, but you know, realizing the, the, the API against the interface within the existing application. If I have more than one, 
I have a little bit more work to do, but OSGI supports filtering um, based on some of the metadata that you can put in service classes. So I can pass in a string to say, give me the service that has um, the name tanks in it, or give me the service that has the name cats in it, and I can get different services based on that filter. Um, I can return many of them, or I can say, all right, there's only supposed to be one based on this filter, and, and I, can, I can just grab the first one in the array. All right, so let's take a look at the demo here. How are we doing on time? Good? All right, good. All right, well, actually, first, let's take a look at um, the sonar of the existing application. So that I just ran this without touching any of the other code there. Um, one of the things to, to notice, the things that you're going to look at is the package tangled in index. This is the thing you've got to kind of keep your eye on as you're modifying code. Um, also take a look at the lines of code, because what you'll see from here is we don't really add that much code when we add the embedded to it. It's really a low bar to entry, um, as well as just the kind of the complexity functions. So um, sonar measures all this stuff at build time. For, is, does anybody, has anybody used sonar before? Show of hands. All right, great. Um, so complexity measures um, cyclomatic complexity, which is kind of a score of how uh, much stuff you're putting in your classes or methods on average. Um, but mainly, let's just take a look at some of the package tangled indexes just to show the coupling. So this grid kind of shows what packages are using what, and if they're all downstream dependencies, they show up as gray, meaning that there's no cyclical dependency, but if you have anything in red here, that means your code is, one's using it, and then it's using it, so those things are actually kind of <coughs> coupled together, and Sonar will tell you, you know, which ones are using which ones. Um, so just one of the things to keep the eye on as you're building an application, you want this to not be red. All right, so let's take a look at this application. Here. Close these guys down. All right, so it spins up with a map. Um, there's different things on the map. There's missiles that they can shoot at each other um, for scores. We're gonna create a couple new agents. I can select what these things are gonna use to uh, determine how they shoot each other. And I get a tank down here. There's my red tank. And we'll add a blue tank as well. There's my blue. What I can do is I run the simulation. It runs very quickly. They're going around. And the first one to 50 ends up winning. And we finally got to 50. Well, no, they ran out of time. So, um, let me just check how we're doing here. So what we want to do here, um, let me just start that up one more time, is now I want to add in my cat module, my cat cartridge, so that it's a bunch of cats chasing each other around shooting each other. Um, so what I can do is now I can go in to my free web console that I now have since I'm using OSGI, and I can add that bundle. So what if I go back to main, I have this list of all the different bundles that are installed within my application. And if I want to add one, I get this nice interface. So I'm going to take the alternate tanks, add that in. I'm going to check it to start and refresh the packages once that's done. So now what I see is I'm going to have 21 bundles total. There's my alternate bundle. Now if I go up, I can look at the configurations. And I have several services that I've built out in the application. These services can all have different configuration. Um, so right now, this configuration is defaulting to the default tank um, world, which is using tanks. But if I want to use the alternate one, I can change that and save it, and it's going to bind that configuration to the framework. So now I've just changed configuration. And I didn't have to write any code for this interface. This is just a bundle that I installed, and, and it just works. 
Um, so at this point, I've, I've installed my new one, which we'll see here. Here's the alternate tank services that are in there. So there's a service that creates the alternate visual world, which has the cats in it. Um, and I've just switched this factory method, which is going to select the alternate world in this case. So I'm using a filter in there to say, all right, take the cat world instead of the, uh, instead of the tank world. Now, this application doesn't have it where I can just spin it up again. That does take some extra effort. Um, but the framework can be refreshed within, uh, within the application if the existing application is built to be run with um, the configuration, just not run at load time. Everything in this application is done at load time. I'd have to do some really major refactoring to allow it to say, OK, now just refresh the config. So we'll restart. All right, and through the restart, this configuration all sticks around. Um, it's all persisted to the file system. There's different ways that you can choose to persist it. Um, usually, it's a good idea to specify a different directory to persist it in. With the framework, it will um, create a cache of all your bundles, and the configuration will also go in that cache. So if you're blowing away your cache in order to, say, load new bundles, or you're not maintaining it properly, you'll also delete the configuration on the system unless you configure the configuration to point uh, to a different uh, directory. So now let's create some new agents. Just go simple. And now we have a cat with a red nose. Do the sound one. There's our cat with the blue nose. We run the simulation. The cats are shooting each other and running around. Um, if we look at the bundle that makes all this happen, you'll see there's not, there's not a lot of code in that because once, you, once you're able to extract, extract things out into modules, you get to reuse a lot of things that maybe you weren't reusing before. Um, so since we have time, I'm going to take, we can go into some of the code um, that does this. Let's take a look. So i got to close some of this stuff out. So here's my tank bundle, my alternate tank bundle. Let's make this bigger. I have my config service, and then I have my two factories. Um, one is the actual implementation of the visual world, which again, I get to extend uh, the tank world, which is implemented in the existing application. And then I basically just change the image locations that it's loading. These images are within the bundle. So as I deploy the bundle, I know that I'm getting all the resources that I need as well. I'm not modifying the physical file system. I can couple things together that make sense together, and things that don't make sense together I can separate. Um, within the properties, so if I were to look at um, what the config looks like, this looks, there's a bit much here in the config because there's a lot of different config options I can put on the games. Um, but I'm basically just annotating strings and providing defaults to those strings um, that will show up in that web interface that we saw before. Um, so as these configurations change, um, the defaults basically, you know, it won't use the defaults once you've changed it there. It'll just rebind it. Um, and then this factory, you know, it'll, so there's lots of configs. I can load it all in the framework. There's some code that basically uses um, to load in the players. And then I can expose different things to the existing application through these getter methods. Um, this is all built to an interface. Um, so the interface defines what, what all these are, and this is just an implementation of that. Um, so if I were to look at this, um, so let's take a look at the alternate config. What I end up seeing is all of the different configuration options are available for me to edit. So everything that I annotated in there, I can change things. Um, and in this case, because I have to restart the game, um, because, the, because the existing application is not built for that, um, I can change it, save it, restart. But in an application that's meant to be reloaded, I don't even necessarily have to take that step. I just change the configuration, and it's instantly available for me to use. Um, 
You can see there's different types of things that I can put in here. It supports you know, numbers, booleans, lists, if I want to do lists and arrays of things. So um, there's lots of robustness that you can take advantage of um, by using the, the OSGI specification. All right. Then I've also, I'm building this with sonar as well, sonar analysis. Um, one thing to notice is the actual, the, the tangled index did decrease. I don't, I didn't introduce any new dependencies. There was eight before, there's eight after. Um, but as I refactor the application, I can keep an eye on those things and continue to drive those things down. And then once I get it where everything is untangled, then I can even start going to that next step, which is bundling the entire application. And then I could even potentially move to a full OSGI solution, if that makes sense for the application. Um, looking at the lines of code at the top, I really didn't add that much lines of code. There's about 100 lines of code to add this stuff to your, to your application. So we're not talking about a very high barrier to entry. Um, you know, I think in conversations I've had with companies that are looking, they want modularity so badly, but they've heard so many bad things about OSGI, just having, showing them that, look, we can do this in about 100 lines of code just to get the frame, framework up and running, and then we can experiment with it, see where it's gonna work for us, where it's not gonna work for us, and learn those lessons without saying, hey, I'm gonna take this entire application, I'm gonna divvy it up, and I'm gonna try to put it all in OSGI at once, which I think is a much more difficult road to cross for most people. Um, especially if you're dealing with an organization where they haven't worked with the framework very long, and they're still learning how to design modular code. Um, so let's, done our demo. Um, so just to summarize, um, in many applications, there's things that you have to think about before you start building, and there's things that you can add in afterwards. Fortunately, um, because of all the different things that are available in OSGI, there are options to add modularity even if you forgot to build it that way to begin with. Um, because of some of the different things that uh, you encounter in your projects and the different libraries you're using, um, it may be very difficult to go with a single bundle approach. So using an embedded framework can add value without having to go refactor everything else right away. Um, or at all if, if you're using things that don't really jive well with the framework. Um, and via embedding, you still have the power of all the different community projects that are available. Um, you know, the one I'm using right here is Felix. Felix has a very um, broad, uh, ecosystem of different tools that you can, that you can build in. Um, and since OSGI is a specification, you know, you can steal things from, you know, the Eclipse project as well. I mean, the, as long as they, they meet the spec, most of the time you can just put it in and it just works. Um, so, um, you know, the purpose of this talk is just to, to try to show some different ways that you can get modular frameworks into your organization, and I think embedding OSGI is one of those ways that um, you can start off that conversation of building modular arch architectures at the enterprise level without the entire enterprise having to agree that this is the way to go. Um, so, I don't know, how am I doing on time, Bill? Six minutes, do we, so six minutes, do we have any questions? Yeah, the, the current, there's, there's something wrong with the uploads. So the, uh, I, I added those probably two weeks before the presentation and I've, I've evolved it since then. So um, all of this stuff will be available on my GitHub as well. Um, I put all my presentations in. All the sample code will be out there as well um, with, uh, with documentation. Um, there's also a really good document on, on embedding Felix on the Felix website just to get started with some of the other things that you can look at, like let's say, you want to do boot delegation instead of the, uh, the, extending the system packages, it explains some things on, on how you would do that instead. Yeah. One of the, 
One of the tricky things with injection frameworks and dependency injection frameworks like IOC is they are dealing with reflection across packages and across physical jars, um, which kind of assumes one class loader, you're dealing with a class loader at the parent level where I can get back and, and everybody has the same class and the same version of that class. Um, I found that combining Spring across bundles in an OSGI framework creates a lot of problems because of the class. You can really only have one of them working the class loader at, at one time. You could use Spring within a bundle sometimes, um, but trying to use Spring across bundles or the inject across bundles, I've found that that causes a lot of issues. Um, I don't know, does anybody else have any experience working with dependency injection within OSGI? I mean, I, it's caused me a lot of pain, so I've just stopped doing it. <laughs> I use OSGI as my in dependency injection framework, essentially. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, going through, I mean, so I've worked with embedding, with working with CXF within OSGI, and there's a lot of work that you have to do if you're with context class loaders where, okay, I'm now I'm going to switch this class loader, that class loader, I'm going to do some work, and then I'll flip back to the class loader that I'm currently in. And uh, yeah, that, that gets a little tricky. Anything else? Yeah, so I mean, the, the three things that I mentioned, uh, especially just you, configuration is a wonderful place to start because it's stateless, you know, the, well, gen generally more state, stateless than something that might be, that might be modified very often. Um, but you get that free interface that every company feels like they have to build their own admin screen. And it's not really something you need to do when you've already got communities that have built very robust administration screens. So if you have stuff that, properties that you modify within your application at runtime. I mean, I know some folks use, you know, JMX for that or, or whatever. Y you've got a nice little web interface that you can add hooks for those configuration options. And it's a very quick win that you can show and it's visual and it's like, hey, we didn't have an admin screen before. Now we have an admin screen. Um, you know, creating objects and, and being able to drop um, a new factory in without having to start, start and stop the, or stop and start the application is another quick win. So we have an implementation that calculates tax on a certain transaction. Now I've got a factory that um, I'm going to add a new country in or a new state in, and guess what? We didn't have any downtime because I just slipped it in there, and now it's, it's resolved, it's installed, it's active, it's working. Um, you know, those are, those are kind of the, the showy things that make people go, wow. We've been doing rolling, you know, start and stops on all of our war files to get this to work. This is something that we wouldn't necessarily have to do that with. Well, so in, in Tomcat, you could in, embed it into a war file, but you know, it, a lot of times it's just easier, especially if you're dealing with J2EE, to use a container that already has the embedded. So Wildfly is the, uh, the Red Hat, or the, uh, the um, JBoss, is the new JBoss one. It comes with an embedded OSGI framework, and one of the nice things that you can do, instead of embedding it into the war, which makes it only available to that war, you do it at the container level, and then you have multiple wars that can potentially share services. So you get much more reuse out of that type of an architecture rather than saying, I'm just going to make it so this one war file can, um, can take advantage of it. But you, you could do that if you wanted to. All right, I think we're, uh, we're right on time. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs>